thank you very much. And uh, thanks so much for uh, to Jim and to Antoine for uh, organizing what looks uh, like it's going to be a tremendous meeting. Um, I've been very much looking forward to it um, over the course of uh, really the last couple of months. Um, a couple of things before I get started. First of all, I thank Alan for actually um, presenting some of our paper um, in addition to <laughs> his, which was great. Um, but, uh, but that's one of the great things about going after Alan. Um, uh, the the um, uh, foundation is laid. Um, the second thing I want to do is thank uh, my co-author in this paper, Jonathan Weiler, um, who's my longtime uh, collaborator and co-author of uh, the book that we did on polarization some time ago. Um, he can't take any uh, credit, unfortunately, or you know, fortunately for him, for the uh, title of the talk that we've come up with today. Um, we took the title of our book and put the word still after it. Uh, <laughs> not exactly on the cutting edge of creativity, I understand. Um, uh, but you know, when you spend about 30 seconds on figuring out what the title is, um, that's, okay. that's where you end up. Um, but anyway, I, I want to recognize the fact that Jonathan's very much um, part of this, and to the extent that um, we have a discussion about um, the uh, paper that we <coughs> presented, you know, uh, all of the hard questions um, should go to him. Um, so uh, in that sense, uh, what we're going to talk about is a cruel sounding term, uh, authoritarianism. Anybody who knows me um, knows me as a pretty mild-mannered guy and, and probably thinks, how, how did Hetherington ever start to write about um, a topic as uh, uh, nasty sounding as authoritarianism? Um, and the fact is, it's, it's Jonathan. No, no, it's, um, it, it's actually not that at all. Um, it, it's a term that you know we are kind of stuck with um, from uh, from uh, the old time sort of psychology, old um, personality and conservatism literature from years and years ago. Um, but the one thing that I want to make clear here is, you know, we're not using the term in a pejorative way. When I give uh, long uh, uh, sort of talks on this, the person who I identify as my exemplar of. Um, uh, authoritarianism is my beloved dad, um, uh, who uh, would absolutely score high and be completely unapologetic of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with that in mind, um, I, I just want uh, to, to point that up. And when we're talking about folks who score high in authoritarianism, what we're talking about is people who um, have a high need for closure, have a high need for order, um, have concerns about difference, um, uh, tend to score high in conventionality, um, conscientiousness, things along those lines. Um, Jonathan and I went to dinner at a um, Thai restaurant uh, in Cleveland Park yesterday. I doubt there were any high-scoring authoritarians there. Um, so, um, in that sense, that's um, what we're, um, uh, you know, what we have in mind when we talk about this. Not, you know, some, you know, Darth Vader-like figure or stormtroopers or anything along those lines. So, um, what we're looking for, actually, uh, or you know, started to set out um, to do, and I think Alan and and, uh, and uh, Jonathan and I were working on these things at very much the same time. Uh, was digging below the surface of why we have this um, apparent um, polarization, at least in voting behavior and things along those lines that, uh, that we apparently have. And we came up, um, you know, building on Jim Stimson and uh, Ted Carmines' work, this notion of worldview evolution. Now, worldview evolution is something that starts, um, you know, or uh, issue evolution is something that starts in the 60s with the evolution of um, uh, race into uh, an issue of partisan contestation, whereas it wasn't before. Um, and we see um, uh, building upon that, um, uh, that uh, fundamental divide in public opinion uh, over the course of years. And um, one of the observations that a couple of people made in introducing the conference is the importance of understanding um, all these different levels of politics, all these different levels of parties, and understanding what's going on. Because what we're suggesting here is that um, the, what we describe as a worldview divide, and the worldview we're talking about is um, how authoritarian or non-authoritarian somebody is, um, is very much driven by the strategic decisions that political elites make um, in deciding um, how they are um, best likely to win elections. Um, so, you know, in that sense, um, the Republicans, especially coming out of 1964, were incredible losers. Um, uh, they had been losing for decades before that. They needed new ideas um, as to how to reorganize the political system. And they kept coming up with new ideas um, that seemed to be successful in peeling off what um, Kevin Phillips, you know, talked about and Pat Buchanan talked about as sort of, you know, Rizzo, uh, Rizzocrats, um, you know, uh, Wallace uh, Democrats from the South and things like that. So over the course of decades, starting with race and ethnicity, then moving into law and order, um, then into uh, fights against uh, the ERA, um, later gay rights, the war on terrorism, the best way to deal with threats from the Soviet Union. Um, what developed out of that was a sorting process um, uh, that uh, the, the sort of personality construct, authoritarianism, and as I'll talk about at the end of the, the talk, if you don't like the term authoritarianism, you can, uh, and, and scholars are talking about it 
the same thing in all sorts of different ways now, whether it's these innate differences on the biological level that John Hibbing and his co-authors are talking about, or big five personality um, differences that, um, that uh, the folks at Yale are talking about. Um, we use the term authoritarianism because we could measure it over a long period of time going back to 1992. All right, so um, you know this has produced clearly a different type of politics. Alan touched on several of these things, but we see evidence of the fact that Republicans and Democrats choose to live in different types of places um, these days. Of course, Republicans find themselves living in rural places. Um, Democrats tend to find themselves living in um, uh, urban places. Uh, they seem to prefer different foods, as I suggested. Ethnic foods are um, seem to be the place uh, uh, in urban places near edgy museums um, presenting. Um, uh, uh, abstract art um, is where you're going to find uh, liberals these days. Um, you know, I'm sure you've seen all the pictures of them watching different sports. Um, certainly, Republicans seem to watch more sports. They especially like um, watch uh, lots of college football to the extent that Democrats have their sports. They watch the WNBA um, uh, and things along those lines. Um, uh, so you, you know, you have that. Um, we see the sort of differences in uh, physiological responses to threats. Um, and things along those lines. And one of the things that we think is actually important about our contribution relative to you know, some of the others is, um, whereas this, um, you know, these differences between liberals and conservatives are, now, uh, are, are, are often talked about as innate and timeless, you know, going all the way back to the beginning of humankind, we don't necessarily think that. We think that a lot of how, I mean, we do think that people are different, um, but a key reason for why this manifests itself in politics these days is because of the decision that elites have made. We didn't have to have a politics that was divided by race and sexual orientation and immigration and things along those lines. But as the issue agenda changes um, and sharpens, and, um, and, and especially in the uh, part of the paper that Jonathan wrote, um, talking about these last five years, um, you know, it, it makes clear that the decisions that um, uh, that political elites are making are making the types of things that make a certain type of conservative and a certain type of liberal um, salient. And this gets at the sort of cultural differences that Alan's talking about relative to, say, the income differences um, otherwise. So how does this manifest itself in certain ways? One of the things that I just love um, is uh, this sort of um, uh, demonstration of um, partisans' feelings about um, the other party. Um, people love their own party, but they don't love their own party any more than they used to. Um, going back to the Carter years, um, through the Obama years, um, what scholars do is we ask these feeling thermometer questions. Many of you are, of course, familiar with them. Um, you know, the NES trots into somebody's living room and shows somebody a thermometer um, and says, you know, between zero, where you're really cold towards a group you don't like it at all, towards a up to 100, where you absolutely love the group, where do you place yourselves on, the, uh, on this uh, scale? And you know, there's always been this great in-party in um, favor, uh, 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 favoritism, um, which isn't surprising. People are identifiers with these parties. But what's happened since the, um, especially the second half of the Bush years, is um, people don't like their own party anymore. In fact, um, some Republicans really dislike their party more um, of late. But they really hate the other side. Um, I mean, really hate it. Just to put these, um, these uh, failing thermometer scores from 2010 into some perspective, Republicans give the um, Democratic Party lower mean scores than they give atheists, um, which you know you wouldn't guess necessarily. Um, the mean scores are basically what the um, for both parties of the other party are basically what um, Americans gave the John Birch Society um, in the 1970s, back when the NES used to ask colorful questions about groups in society. Um, the only groups that it beat, um, uh, the, these means would beat, are things like people who riot in cities, which is another one of the great um, questions that the NES used to ask in the early 70s. Another, and this is a project that Tom Rudolph and I have been working on um, over time, um, is um, how much um, trust in government is actually polarized um, as time goes by. And we think this has extraordinarily important implications um, for um, governance. Um, if, the, if people who are in the out party and the electorate don't trust the uh, government run by the other side, um, there's no way to reach them. There's, they're not going to make an ideological sacrifice, say, to, um, to support the policies that uh, re Republicans in the electorate, they don't trust the Democratic administration, aren't going to be um, uh, supportive of the policy agenda um, from the left in this case, or uh, this seems to be just a Republican phenomenon. It's actually a Democratic phenomenon, too, during the late Bush years, um, where trust in government absolutely collapses um, for those on the other side. Um, and you know, as you take a look, I mean, the difference between trust and government uh, of the different parties, depending upon who runs the government, wasn't that big up until you know fairly recently. And this um, poses huge problems um, for governance. And we think that the fact 
is that people don't understand the other side in the same way that maybe they used to understand the other side when the party system was organized around something less visceral, so less fundamental, less innate um, in, uh, in how this, um, in, in, in terms of how this uh, uh, plays out. So what we took on over um, the last uh, month or so was trying to decide whether this worldview um, divide was um, still in place. And of course, we wouldn't be here giving the talk today if we didn't find that the answer was yes. Um, you know, in fact, the worldview divide um, that we identified is in fact um, still in place. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of reasons um, to think um, that this would be the case. Um, the issues that we think um, activate, um, make people think about themselves as Republicans or Democrats in, in these particular ways are, are, are simply difficult to um, resolve. So um, security from foreign threats. Um, more, most recently, of course, terrorism isn't as central as it was before. Um, uh, but you know, Benghazi is. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's always a you know, sort of new manifestation of um, these types of issues. Immigration is an issue that Republicans would love to be able to resolve. Um, but you know, we go into some detail um, in the paper suggesting that um, because of the worldview divide that we have in the new type of base of the Republican Party, it's very difficult for Republicans, uh, Republican elites to nudge public opinion among Republican followers in a direction that would allow them to resolve this particular issue. Um, so in that sense, Republicans are kind of dealing with um, the, the types of electoral strategies that they've um, built up in the past and created a best of voters that you really can't convince to move in a different direction on immigration, even though um, the future of the Republican Party, um, as Alan's um, uh, data, of course, clearly show, is really, really important um, for them to be able to do. And of course, race is an issue that's been with us um, since, you know, potentially the beginning of time, um, certainly um, powerfully in the um, uh, Civil War period. And one of the things that I, I, I don't know what exactly to make of it, Alan made reference to it as well, but the last time we've had elections as close as these were the late 1800s, which of course was you know the sort of post-reconstruction period when race was oh you know sort of important um, you know during the course of things. Um, another contribution that we make, I think, in this paper is to suggest that even the issues that used to be important, you know, that created the divide, um, seem to be either new issues are being added or issues that didn't seem to be part of that divide are becoming part of that divide. So um, take climate change. Climate change, if you go back before the, um, uh, the most recent years, there's uh, no difference between um, uh, Republicans and Democrats or um, even authoritarians and non-authoritarians as it relates to people's belief in, uh, in climate change. Um, these days, I'll show you in just a minute, there are enormous differences. Um, healthcare reform. Healthcare reform is an issue that you know Michael Tesler has done a good bit of work with, showing that back in the 1980s, racial attitudes controlling for partisanship were not important to understanding people's um, attitudes about healthcare reform when it was Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton's idea. Um, of course, you know these days um, the differences are stark. In fact, Tesler even shows that um, racial attitudes can be activated in uh, understanding people's evaluations of Obama's dog Bo. Um, so, you know, in that sense, um, racial attitudes seem to be, you know, an increasing um, central feature. Um, of politics. So in other words, the thing, the key point that Jonathan and I want to make here is that um, the key point is that these um, ideas um, have not gone away. So first of all, how do we or measure authoritarianism? I promise I'm almost to the end. Um, uh, is by, we ask people, uh, and this is not our idea, I believe it's Stanley Feldman's idea, we ask people about um, uh, you know, their uh, desire uh, for what um, ideal children would look like, the, um, uh, the qualities in children that um, people uh, would like their children to possess. Um, and of course, um, anybody who's a parent out there, and I know most of you are, we'd like all eight um, on one level or another, especially after you have kids, you really kind of like the obedience one. Um, but it's a question of um, you know, how people relatively weight these things. And of course, you know, people who score low in authoritarianism choose uh, independence, self-reliance, um, uh, uh, curiosity and being considerate, and of course the opposite are the high-scoring authoritarians. And one of the things I just want to pause and say is, you know, you can call this anything. You know, it's called authoritarianism in the literature, but it blows us away, frankly, um, that um, something as far removed from politics is so predictive of people's political attitudes. Um, I think that that's really quite remarkable um, when you get right down to it. So just to show you um, how big of an impact you know this uh, measure has on a bunch of different things since um, our writing of our book in 2009. You know, we prevent, present a few graphs. Um, this one, of course, is you know one of the fundamentals: voting. Um, uh, on the x-axis is the number of authoritarian responses that people give to those items, and the percentages, of course, are on the y-axis. And you see, you know, tremendous. Um, uh, and again, this is all uh, involving white voters. Again, the, this authoritarianism index actually. I've done some. 
um, more recent research, it doesn't capture um, uh, the, what it's supposed to capture among racial and ethnic minorities, so this is whites um, voting only. Um, but you see you know, 40 and 50 and 60 percentage point differences in voting in 2010. You see the same thing um, in 2012, slightly um, less um, in that year. You see um, how partisanship, um, people's choice of which party and how strongly they identify um, uh, has, has opened up, you know, back as early as, or as, not as long ago even as 1992. I mean, we're still only talking 20 years. There's no difference between high and low scoring authoritarians as it relates to party identification. And really, in 2002, the differences are small, 13 percentage points between the top and the bottom of the scale. Um, now we're talking about 30 um, percentage points. And even though the focus in this literature is often on the people who score high um, in authoritarianism, because that's what the old time literature was about, what Jonathan and I have you know, pointed out often is really a lot of the action is taking place in people who score low. Um, you see that the, the um, bottom line is the one that's actually really moving um, uh, more than the top line is uh, any longer. Um, here we see Obama's approval rating um, in both 2010 and 2012. <laughs> Um, high scoring uh, authoritarians um, uh, really just don't like him, you know, under 20, uh, under 30 percent, under 20 percent, um, whereas low scoring authoritarians, the guy can do no wrong. Um, so, you know, we have this. It's also interesting to note as it relates to this, if you look at Democrats who don't approve of Obama, which is a relatively small group of people, almost all of them are high scoring authoritarians. Um, you know, so in that sense, um, it's not just a partisan story, you know, controlling for partisanship, this is the case. I should add, for Republicans, not any of them approve of him. So so they all, um, no matter where they score on the scale, um, don't uh, go there. And these are various different issues. You guys might recall from the 2010 um, uh, CCES, the, uh, they asked a number of questions to people um, about uh, issues that came before Congress and the degree to which, um, uh, if they were members of the Congress, how they would have voted, the, that is ordinary people. And they asked about things like, um, uh, the repeal of DADT, Obamacare, um, uh, spending federal money on stem cells, immigration reform, cap and trade, all of these different things. And of course, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, 60 and 70, um, 50 and 60 and sometimes 70 percentage point differences between high and low scoring authoritarians on all of these different issues, you know, which suggests, again, these are all salient considerations. Um, and then, you know, of course, we have, you know, things like um, cap and trade and, and uh, Obamacare, which we believe are you know, kind of framed in more sort of fundamental differences kind of work and, and all of that. Um, and then, of course, the last thing that um, we point to is uh, the Tea Party. The Tea Party is definitely a movement that is supported at least by you know, folks who um, tend to be um, high scoring uh, authoritarians as opposed to low scoring and the like. Um, so all of this suggests that we, you know, we weren't wrong. Um, you know, uh, back in uh, uh, 2009 when we were writing these things. Um, and the last thing that I just want to say is one of the things we find kind of gratifying um, about the work that we've done, you know, we, we've used a certain language because we were kind of stuck with a certain language. Um, but you see all of these different, you know, sort of innate differences, um, uh, physiological differences, um, genetic differences, um, whatever type of research. Um, and, you know, we, we feel like it's all of the same piece. We're not married to you know, a particular term or a particular way of thinking about it. The key point here is, is that people's decisions about politics are happening you know, perhaps in like a pre-cognitive way where people just have these you know, sort of quick uh, um, reactions to how they ought to respond to politics. And as a result, it makes it very, very hard to understand um, where the other side is coming from. So thank you very much. We'll look forward to talking thank more about it.